All right, we'll be starting in about two minutes. We're waiting for our guest uh, to arrive. And I'll probably need to stop sharing when he shares his stuff. Yep, we're live right now. Awesome. I'm not sure Tim has a presentation. We'll ask him when he gets on. Okay. We're just waiting for our guest. We'll be starting momentarily. Welcome, Tim. Hey, Ted. How are you doing? I'm good. I'm good. Where are you coming from today? I uh, I know you live downstate. Where are you, uh, are you downstate or are you someplace warm? You look like you're cold. <laughs> yeah, I'm in Champaign-Urbana. Yeah, okay. And you've lived there for how long? Gosh, 12 years, 13 12 years. years. 12 years. Well, thanks for uh, joining us on our first solar webinar. Uh, you are the expert here today. And if you don't mind, Tim, I'll let you go first. Now, you don't have slides, right? I do not. Yeah. Okay. So let's just get into it. So, so Tim Montague is uh, one of the co-hosts of the Clean Power Hour, which is a weekly news roundup of the latest solar, wind, storage, and energy transition news. Uh, they're experts in both uh, in EVs, robotics, SpaceX, Tesla, everything geeky that I love. And so Tim's kind of like my idol. So Tim, uh, I appreciate you being here today. Tell me a little bit. Uh, why why solar and why now sure well thanks for having me tad and hello everyone it's good to be here i uh i grew up doing backyard solar thermal in albuquerque new mexico i was born in indiana but grew up in new mexico my dad was a professor and very diy uh, techie self-taught programmer uh self-taught toxics expert and um, so PV was just barely on the scene, right? PV was invented in 1954 and then really came into its own in the 60s and 70s, but was used in, in esoteric applications like satellites and, you know, mountaintops because it was very expensive, 100, 100 plus dollars a watt. You know, fast forward to uh, 2010 and, and, and uh, that's when solar took off here in North America. Um, so it is American technology, but ironically, some other countries kind of leaned into it faster, harder, like Germany, Japan, and um, and now China. But uh, we're experiencing a heyday for solar and and storage, and and solar and wind are the fastest growing sources of new energy on the grid globally. And 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 that has to do with the economics. Uh, solar is now thirty cents a watt, approximately, and and so we've seen this very rapid decline that the it's called the cost adoption curve and that's why solar now uh is is really taking off is is because it photons are free they are hugely abundant we get ten thousand times more sunlight than we use energy wise right so we're literally swimming in energy and now we have the technology to convert that energy to electricity meanwhile we are electrifying um our built environment and and an interesting statistic on that front is that you know electricity is only part of the energy spectrum today we use a lot of fossil fuels fast forward to 2050 so today i think solar i mean sorry electricity is around 26 percent of our energy usage fast forward to 2050 it's going to be 74 percent and and that's because of the electrification of transportation uh, starting to use more electricity for heavy industry, 
and um and then you know greening the grid of course and and moving away from coal natural gas and and even nuclear um nuclear is low carbon and so you know once you've built that infrastructure it is good to keep it running i i live in the most nuclearized state that is illinois and and i don't know if our listeners here are coming from uh, other places but uh, that is a little known fact that Illinois is the most nuclearized state in the United States. Uh, I think upwards of 40% of our grid power comes from nuclear. Yeah, that's incredible. You know, one of the questions I always get, Tim, is uh, isn't, isn't nuclear going to win? You got, you got any uh, horse in this race or you just like all things? So what, what do you think about that? Well, I am somewhat biased because my father was involved in a project called WIP. Uh, in southern New Mexico, it's a long-term waste storage facility for nuclear waste, and WIP has been a bit of a nightmare. Uh, it, it was problematic from the get-go, and that's the only problem that I have with nuclear is we don't really know what to do with the waste. The waste is radioactive and highly so for a very long time, and so you have to engineer a container or a way to containerize that waste, and what we do largely today is we put it on site in barrels or uh, in, in, sometimes we embed it in concrete and then put it in pools of water. And it's just, it's a liability because of the second law of thermodynamics, not to get too geeky, but things don't want to stay put. That's the nature of matter is it wants to move around. And, and so nuclear waste is, is a challenge, but today the economics of nuclear are not on its side. It's a new nuclear plant cost, the energy cost around 30 cents a KWH, and you can build a large-scale uh, PV plant for four cents, and and so literally, it's it's like ten times more expensive than solar, and that's why we only have one or two nuclear plants under construction in the U.S. today, and globally, it's not really a thing. Now, the SMR industry will eventually come on. Probably, that's the small modular reactor. That's kind of the next gen. Uh, and, you know, it's used on nuclear submarines. It'll be used on Mars. I think it's great for exploring space. Uh, but here on Earth, we're, we're just swimming in wind and solar, and, and it's hard to compete. Yeah, one of my, uh, one of my sons is a nuclear engineering major, and, and uh, I said by the time he gets nuclear all over the place, solar will have already powered the whole world, so he'll be, he'll be uh, late, to the, late to the race. Yeah, it's very slow to develop a nuclear power plant also. Not that solar plants are fast, you know, it can take years, but it, it's, it's, a, it's a decade plus to develop a nuclear power facility. So that's we not- some, We may have uh, some Illinois viewers here. Um, aren't we shutting down some nuclear plants here in Illinois, if I recall? Well, we're threatening to, and we came yeah. very close to uh, closing several, um, and, and there's been several near misses. And that's, you know, in the, in the new omnibus energy bill that we have, we call it CJA. Um, the Climate and Equitable Jobs Act that was signed this past September and is really just kind of now coming into force, that subsidizes the nuclear industry uh, in parallel with wind, solar, and battery storage. It's a both and. And, and that was the same with the first wave, which was fu uh, the Future Energy Jobs Act, FIJA, back in 2016 when that got signed. So those assets are important to Illinois, and 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 we want to we want to keep them going. It's it's a it's a relatively reasonable trade off to make, um, but they're big big machines. They just don't run forever. You they will eventually you know need to be torn torn down. What do your friends say to you, Tim? When when people say uh, the the technology is only going to get better, so I'm going to wait. About solar? Yeah. Well. The technology is actually already asymptoting, you know, in terms of efficiency. We're we're in the we're in the low twenties. I think the most efficient uh, solar panels are now like twenty four percent efficient. There's a physical limit of I think around thirty three percent, and and so you know it it has gone up, but it's a it's an S curve and it's and it's now it's peaking. kind of doing this, and so yeah, it's going to continue to get cheaper and more efficient, and we'll develop next-gen technologies. They're, the the next-gen approach appears to be a hybrid where you, you stack multiple technologies like perovskites, which are 
<clears throat> uh, a very thin film, so they're translucent. So you can use a perovskite on top of a traditional crystalline cell. So there's some companies going after that. Um, and, but yeah, we have the tech, that's the cool thing is we have the technology truly to completely green the grid and, uh, and decarbonize the economy. It's just a matter of, of uh, willpower and, you know, you know, sticking to our guns, I guess, and having a sense of urgency. We're, I like to say we humans, we're not very good at thinking long-term like that, right? It's, it's baked into us to think a year or two out. And now we need to think 50, 100, 500 years. And, and that's a shift that humanity is going through. Yeah, I mean, the big uh, shift for me as a, as a human being, I've always been kind of geeked out with solar, but the uh, started playing with it in 2005. But, you know, during COVID, when we saw all the air pollution disappear all over the world, and you could actually see the sky in Mumbai and in Shanghai and Beijing and uh, LA and different places, it was literally like, I was literally shocked, like a light switch was turned off or, or turned on. And I, I just said, this is just so easy. Um, we can, we can, we can do this within the bounds of economic uh, prosperity. We don't, this isn't just something that, you know, only green people do. So uh, how do you know, I think you told me already, Tim, but how did you, how did you get into sustainability? What was your first like project to tell me a little bit about your early history? Yeah, it really was my childhood and my dad's interest in, in renewables. Uh, that was solar thermal, making hot water and, and cookers. That's what uh, most people think of when they think of solar, right? They think of solar heat. Yeah, and there was a there was a hot water, solar hot water industry nationwide and here in Illinois. The the first solar companies were all hot water companies. And then there was a crossing over economically, I don't know, maybe 20 years ago, where PV started to really eat into that. And and now it's pretty much flip-flopped and there's 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 not a whole lot of 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 hot water industry solar hot water because you can make hot water with electricity and 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 those um and pv is just more economical so that's one of the reasons that is going on now for industry there is a next gen thermal technology that is that is rolling out in north america um i had a guest on my podcast from canada that is working with this and they're using trackers a single axis tracker to uh to to do next gen solar thermal for industrial applications but so so yeah energy is just in my blood my my grandpa here in chicago also ran a, a coal industry magazine called the black diamond so on both sides of my family on my dad's side you know him being a techie and into the environment he's a, he's an environmentalist and then i became an ecologist by training i studied swamp forest in northern wisconsin and and so sustainability technology and people are kind of in my in my blood and and i've just continued and been opportunistic uh honestly i'm kicking myself for not getting into solar sooner because i lived in in southern california i went to school in uc san diego and i could have worked in the industry back in the early 2000s uh would have loved that but uh i i got distracted and did a bunch of other things um so i'm very i'm very curious though and and tech forward and um and grabbed onto it when I could. I thought I'd work in wind before I worked in solar because in Illinois, the, there were big tranches of wind came in before the PV market really took off. But when we got our first RPS, Renewable Portfolio Standard, and that is the foundation in most places for a good renewable energy industry, we got a 25% by 2025 RPS in 2008. And, uh, and that's still a, a driver. And now we're, we're, I think we're gunning for 40% by 2035, something like that. Yeah, it's interesting. I've been getting a lot of calls here in Illinois from out-of-state developers saying, oh, we want to be in Illinois. Uh, you know, it's partly incentive-driven, but I, I think, you know, from a latitude standpoint, I think the, and uh, most people think that, you know, Illinois is too dark or too cold to support solar. And uh, I just, for example, got Tesla solar roof installed on my house. And, uh, you know, it's, it's ready. It's, I mean, the, the, the solar industry is ready here in Illinois. So, so what do you think the big challenge is? I mean, what's, what's your, what's your reason for doing the, the clean power hour and, you know, what, what's the, cha what's your, your challenge? Yeah. To people? yeah. You know, solar is new here in the Midwest yeah. and, and, and we're not known for being bleeding edge here, right? California, things happen first in California, New York, basically. 
and and those two states are the most forward thinking and and new york is is a beast they've got nicerta um you know we have the we have the ipa which is which is a good agency but it's nothing like nicerta nicerta is is hand over fist more advanced and and truly uh driving innovation and r d into the market uh around renewable energy and energy efficiency and and so but it takes a lot of education people think solar's uh smoke and mirrors they think it's you know not real because it does seem to it's it seems too good to be true right you just put this material out in the sun and it makes electricity voila i mean the physics obviously work and and it's not smoke and mirrors there is uh, also that problem that it, it is easy to game the spreadsheet and so you just have to be careful who you work with or it's good bad ugly there's there's plenty of good installers and good contractors in illinois and the industry is maturing very quickly and as you mentioned lots of developers are now coming in and you can do third party ownership so there's very little out of pocket but it just needs there's a lot of education required illinois is still a greenfield and um, you know we'll get there you know you go to you go to colorado or arizona or california or new jersey or new york or massachusetts and you see rooftop solar everywhere here it's it's not part of the regular experience yeah yeah if you drive around your neighborhood in illinois now you'll see a few houses with solar it's coming in because the because of fija and and now cija but it's it's not i mean you see whole developments in in california and now that all new residential construction and soon all new commercial has to have solar on it right so it's really part of the built environment de facto Whereas here it's still very, you know, much a fringe thing. One final question: I, I, someone asked me this morning from a, a very large company that's doing some stuff with renewable gas. They said, "How come? Because my background is building. How come developers aren't doing track housing with every roof with solar?" So I'm assuming they're doing that in California. Are some of the really big guys across the nation doing? you know, whole subdivisions with solar on every roof? They are. And the, I mean, the place that I've been more most recently is the Denver area where you see this phenomenon and places like Boulder County, Boulder County, uh, where, where Boulder is just, just outside of Denver, you know, they have some of the strictest building codes in, in the country. So there's a lot of hmm. super high efficiency, you know, passive house construction is big there. And, um, I, I forgot, Tad, though there's another reason that solar is a latecomer here in the Midwest, and that is that we have very cheap power. You know, I, as a consumer, pay four and a half cents um, in, in Urbana uh, as part of a municipal aggregation program. And through green tags, that is, you know, technically a green energy. But, uh, you know, if you go to California, consumers might pay 18 cents. Right. And, and or or more, sometimes 30 cents, depending on the time of day. And, and same on the East Coast. Energy is more expensive on the coast. And, and the more expensive the energy, the faster ROI you get on solar, because at the end of the day, it's producing electrons, it's producing KWH. And so the value of of each kilowatt is greater where electricity is more expensive. So that is a barrier to entry and why we need incentives like we now have, which are very generous. And so solar will pay back in a few years, uh, three to six years, depending on the, you know, the, the area. And, and so, and then it's a capital expense, right? So it, for residents, it's like buying a car, but for a commercial installation, you know, it's a bigger, it's a, a small project would be fifty thousand dollars. A big project would be five million dollars, and then you're competing with R and D dollars, or building a new facility, or hiring, or you know, there's many things that you can do with five million dollars. And when energy isn't your primary business, that gives owners some pause. Yeah, um, we're a Tesla channel partner in regard to Tesla solar roof, and we're going to talk a little bit about that today. And you know, yeah. it's been a slow, a, a slow up and comer uh, in terms of, you know, people adopting it around the United States. A lot of it has to do with cost, but certainly you can imagine a world in the future where every home that has a has a, a slanted roof of some sort would would just have shingles that are solar shingles. Tesla has been doing it for a long time. They're on a, a three or four or five versions 
you know, yeah. we have Corning's Corning, you know, other companies are, are starting to do it. And it's just like, yeah, why not? Why wouldn't you just take the entire plane of any roof, commercial or residential, and put solar on it? Yeah, built, built in solar or uh, BIPV, we call it building integrated photovoltaics is the bee's knees. It's the holy grail. <laughs> It's uh, GAF is the product I think to watch. GAF yeah. is one of the largest roofing manufacturers. They now have a solar shingle uh, to compete with the Tesla solar roof. The, te the Tesla product is, is a very nice product. It's a very high end product. And so it, it has a limited audience, so to speak, but, but good product. It, it is the, you know, creme de la creme, I would say. Yeah. Tim, I really appreciate you coming on today. I want to be respectful of your time. Would you be willing to stand for a couple more minutes while the other people give oh, a short sure. presentation? Because yeah. there, I know there's some questions in the chat. There might be some more questions on the road. So if you yep. could mute, and I, I really yep. appreciate it. Now we'll talk soon. Thank you. So uh, thanks, Tim. Uh, so Patrick is uh, experienced in solar. He's uh, unmuted himself. He, uh, tell us your story a little bit, Patrick, uh, and then he's going to present uh, just on homes and, and solar in general. Hi, everybody. Yeah, I want to thank everyone for joining this today. Solar has definitely been something that I've been passionate about since college. After graduating from Illinois Wesleyan in Bloomington, I began my solar journey in Arizona doing residential homes and then eventually getting to the engineering and project management of those solar installations. And so kind of like Tim was saying earlier as well, I really feel that Illinois is a couple years behind in terms of what Arizona has been able to do for their residential solar market. Um, it is something that is changing the game in terms of how homeowners can own their energy. And with the current incentives that we'll get about or talk about later on, you'll kind of see why I think that Illinois is such a great place for solar to kind of take over. Um, so first, I just want to talk about, you know, our goals as, as gain renewables, and we definitely, you know, feel that this year is a year we want to get on top of uh, converting homes towards solar energy. Uh, we're goal oriented to get 100 homes towards solar energy this year and 15 commercial businesses. And with the team and inventory that we have, definitely not worried about being able to accomplish that job. Um, as we touched on a little bit earlier as well, you'll see that over 50% of energy or electricity coming from uh, Illinois is coming from nuclear. Um, and about 10% of that really only makes up renewables. But again, Illinois is incentivizing and pushing uh, to bring up that to about 25% by the year 2025. Um, and that again is why you know, we're so ecstatic about being able, the incentives that make it uh, feasible for homeowners and businesses to, to take advantage of. Um, then I want to pre, uh, briefly go over exactly how is it that solar works and often the times it gets you know, a more complicated view than what it really is. Um, it comes down to two main pieces of equipment. Uh, first, which is going to be your solar panel and that solar panel within it has a silicon semiconductor that when excited by photons from the sun is going to produce DC current. Uh, now that DC current is not usable by your home, but that's where the second piece of equipment comes into play and that is the inverter. Uh, the inverter is gonna take that DC, convert it to AC usage, which will then power your home and the appliances. Um, any excess production that's gonna be created by your panels will get sold back to the grid in a, in a program called net metering, which we'll discuss a little later on as well. Uh, but again, I love solar so much because it's a very simple process that's easy for kind of anyone to understand. Um, utility rate increases, we kind of touched on this earlier as well. Illinois definitely has some of the cheapest electricity across the, the nation, but I want you guys to understand that that definitely will not be the case kind of moving forward. ComEd for the first time in four years, I believe, just got approved for $100 million of excess revenue this year, which is hitting businesses and homeowners alike. Um, and the analogy I like to briefly use for this is to imagine that you had locked in your gas prices 25 years ago. Um, for reference, the, the price of gas was about $1.27. And so if you imagine the savings that you would have accumulated by locking in your cost of gasoline, you know, it'd be tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of dollars. 
And that is something that solar provides as a solution for homeowners to avoid these utility rate increases um, and have their energy eventually be free from their system, uh, systems production. Now, uh, the most standard form of a solar installation is gonna be the standard PV panels. Now, this is the most cost-effective method of offsetting your electricity bills. Uh, they come with a robust 25-year warranties on your production or that product. And what's good as well is these also allow you to take advantage of the, the current incentives going on. Um, it is the most typical type of solar installation you'll see throughout Illinois and, and is one that is great for homeowners that have a roof uh, that is able to handle that solar installation. Um, I do want to touch on net metering and this I, I definitely want you guys to have a good takeaway from in Illinois for every kilowatt that you produce, you will receive a one for one credit on your utility bill for that production. And that is very large because again, as we were kind of stating in states like Arizona, where I was from before, they are having to receive a decreased amount. Uh, so they're only receiving about $9.08 per kilowatt. Um, and, and out here it is a one for one value. And as more and more homeowners year over year uh, go solar, they are gonna decrease that value at which you get your production for. So being grandfathered in to this current one-to-one -one trade off program is crucial. Um, and in, in my opinion, it is why one of those things that is looking to incentivize homeowners to do this so that they don't need to build larger systems down the road when the cost of selling that electricity back to the grid decreases. Um, and then just lastly, to kind of touch on the two main incentives, I know Tim had kind of brought them up earlier. The main one right now going on is the federal tax incentive. And in the year 2022, you are going to receive 26% of the cost of your installation in the form of a federal tax credit. As we see as it gets to 2023, that's going to decrease down to 22%. And then in 2024, there is no incentive for residential homeowners to take advantage of there. The other key thing about the federal tax incentive is that to claim the percentage, so in 2022, it's 26%, your system needs to be installed in the year 2022. And then lastly, as I know my colleague Drew will touch upon later as well, is the SREC program or Illinois Shines. And that is basically an agreement that six to nine months after your system is fully operational, you are gonna be receiving a check uh, for 15 years of your production. And that amount too can really help knock off a large portion of the cost of this installation. And so I know we kind of covered a lot of things real quickly. And so I'll hand it back to Tad for kind of some more in-depth questions. Yeah, I've got a, a bunch of them here and we'll just kind of go rifle shot through them. Uh, uh, people have asked about how much are clients involved in the installation process? Right. And, and that's something that I love the way that GAIN has it set up is that as a homeowner or client, you are able to be as involved in the installation process as you want to be. Um, you're going to be a, a assigned a specific project manager who's going to handle all of the install process from you, from installation, your site surveys, permitting, et cetera. And so you'll be updated uh, each time one of those milestones is reached. But as a homeowner, you could decide to go solar and we can simply inform you uh, once that system is up and powered that you have been successfully installed. You know, a lot of things happen in life, Patrick, and, you know, for various reasons. What if I move? Right. And this is this is a question that a lot of homeowners think about and consider before going solar. And I want you to understand two things when it comes to moving. One, going solar and deciding to move, you are absolutely able to take that system with you to your new home, but we definitely want to advise against it. And the reason is because we designed this system tailored to that home's kilowatt usage. And there is no guarantee that when you take that system to your new home, that it's going to fit and produce the same manner as it did on this home. And the second point to that is that, you know, you are actually able to increase your property value of that home with the solar on there. Um, the Department of Energy, I believe, found that utility costs was one of the, the highest concerns that homeowners and buyers have alike when looking into a property. 
uh, my mom lives in a homeowners association. Would she not be able to do this? And so you are absolutely able to do solar installations inside of an HOA. All that you really need to request is to look at your structural or solar guidelines as those HOA have. But a lot of them who maybe in the past two or three years were turning away the ability to do that have opened up to it because of the demand of homeowners wanting to be able to, to do solar installations. What about the financing? Is it better to finance or better to pay cash? That's always kind of a common question. Definitely. Yeah. And so you have to look at them, I think, from the homeowner's case. Um, a cash purchase is definitely the way to go to getting the most discounted amount for your system. But what's nice about the financing as well is that you are locking in that monthly payment for your electricity from your solar system. And these systems are able to get up to 110% offset to where you're going to build those credits through the net metering program that eliminates a majority of your utility bill. And so when you ask, you know, which one is more beneficial, I think it's important to analyze where that homeowner is coming from and whether they want the most amount of savings up front from a cash deal or the ability to lock in that utility cost cheaper than what they're currently paying over the life of that system. I know these, these uh, panels, solar panels have been floating around. I think they were on Apollo spacecraft. I don't know, Tim could probably tell us that, but I mean, they've been around a long time. What uh, what kind of warranty comes with these? Yeah, and what I also love is that the competitiveness of the different types of panels is really driving the market in a positive direction. All of these panels are primarily coming with a standard 20 or 25 year production and product warranty. And so when a lot of people are comparing the different types of panels uh, across the industry, it's important to just know as well that these things are being backed for 20 to 25 years by pretty much all the manufacturers. What do I do if uh, something goes wrong with my system though? No, yeah, absolutely. And what's nice about this as well is that your solar systems are gonna come with an inverter. And with those inverters comes a monitoring application where you're gonna be able to see the layout of your panels and determine what the uh, production rate of each of those are. So in the scenario where a panel is producing under its threshold, so let's say by year four, your panel is producing at 80% when it's supposed to be producing at 96%. That's within your warranty to get a hold of us and be able to get that new panel out to you. So paired with the monitoring application and the warranties, you can feel confident that this system is designed for the long term. What happens if I have to repair a roof, uh, a storm damage or something? Yeah, yeah. And so what's nice as well about the standard PV model is that that system is racketed and bolted into your roof. And so it's very simple uh, to get that system off to be able to replace that roof and reinstall the system. Now, there is a fee, obviously, for getting the panels off of the roof and putting back on, but it's not as large of a cost or as difficult as a process as homeowners may think if their roof is still good for 10 years and they wanna go solar before you know, replacing it. Heck, they had snow in Atlanta recently. So what about snow? Is that like a, a thing that kills uh, solar or how does that work? And this was awesome because this was something that, you know, being from Arizona, I had no experience <laughs> with on how the solar actually worked in the winter. But what's nice is when that system is on and producing, and let's say you get a big snowfall like we had the last couple of days, that system is going to be generating heat when it's turned on. And so that snow is actually going to slip and slide right off those panels off of your roof. It's, it's kind of a cool benefit that, uh, that solar is able to provide. And another thing as well is that, yeah, in the winter months when it's cold, your panels actually produce more efficiently in the cold. And so while you may not be producing wow. as much as, a, as an open sunny day, you're still getting good production out of those panels. Yeah, I think that's a, a common thing. People think that you have to be really hot to produce solar, and it's actually the opposite. I guess that's why Germany and Denmark and a lot of those European countries have so much solar is because it's cool there. <laughs> exactly. What, what, uh, what about leaks? Uh, how do I make sure there's, uh, you know, or, that there's no leaks produced in the roof from the install. T tell us the installation process for at least a residential one. Right, right. And, and again, that's one of the things I love so much about our install team is that those rackings are going to be right on the rafters on your home roof. And we're able to provide that with a sealant before attaching that racking to it. 
And so the combination of the tight fit racking and the sealant with that helps prevent against the, the water leaks that would come from it. What about, uh, how do you size a system for the home? Do you just, you just max it, right? No, and so yeah, this is again, something where we want to look in exactly to what that home's usage is and whether a homeowner has been there for one month or 24 months. What we do is look into your kilowatt usage in that home and extrapolate out what that system or what that home is requiring for usage. It's important to not just, when looking into solar, get a small, medium and large size system to decide between, but to get an exactly designed system to what your uh, kilowatt needs are. And again, we need to, to make sure we stay under that 110% threshold. So that's why sizing is crucial. Uh, okay, so what about the installation process? Just can you, can you give us 30 seconds on that? Yes, yeah. So what will first happen is a site survey uh, to where we're just gonna make sure we know at where everything's at for the install. We're gonna draft up your plans for permitting and HOA approval. Uh, after the permitting process is complete, you'll have an installation, which on standard PV is about a one to two day install. And then after the installation, we'll have the final inspections with the city and the utility company. Uh, once both those things are approved, you'll receive the permission to operate and your system will be up and producing for you. Thanks, Patrick. You always do a great job. I really appreciate it. No worries. So uh, Ron uh, Sikowski is our senior project manager, and we asked Ron to talk a little bit about uh, EVs, which we can also circle back to Tim, because we're excited about EVs in our, in our company. Yes, thank you, Ted. Yeah, EVs are phenomenal, and you're starting to see them everywhere, uh, especially with the uh, chargers. They are putting chargers where they're concentrated in the larger cities, However, uh, EVs have progressed um, far more than, you know, solar. Now the competition is really on, along with your, your Tesla solar roof, as Tim mentioned earlier, and with GF, and they are producing cars that require very little maintenance, and the the warranty on the batteries are phenomenal. Batteries are getting bigger and better. The range is there. Uh, it's, so it's, it's an excellent opportunity for you to become green. So why didn't, why didn't you, or I, I'm the one who actually talked Ron into getting a Tesla. So Ron, you got a Tesla, not just because they're super cool, but uh, what was holding you back? You're a big car guy. Well, the, the number one thing with, uh, with EVs, everyone has range anxiety. And that range anxiety is, oh man, where am I going to be able to find the next charging station? Uh, it's not like a ICE vehicle where you can just stop at a gas station. There's a gas station on every corner and some corners there's four gas stations. What, what's ICE? Explain that to our viewers. ICE is internal combustion engine, which is your standard uh, gas or diesel vehicle. Right. or even uh, naturally natural gas propelled vehicles. So that is, that's the number one concern everyone has. And these Tesla has vehicles that can go up to 500 miles on a single charge. So range anxiety, once you are in an EV vehicle, it's, there's no more anxiety. There's plenty of plenty of options to charge and there's an app on your phone uh plug share and it shows you they're the top rated with over 300,000 users and they are the top rated app that shows you where every charger is and you just plug your destination in and it knows your range knows what vehicle you plug in what vehicle you're using and it will show you where you need to charge and when you need to charge. So, so you have, I know you have family in Indianapolis and you live in Chicago. So uh, t tell us about that journey. When you take your Tesla to Indianapolis, uh, where do you stop? Well, that's, uh, Ted, you can actually, with the Tesla, you can actually make it with all the way to Indianapolis and beyond. However, I usually stop either in West Lafayette at a DC supercharger 
uh, or Fair Oaks Farm, which is also a DC supercharger. And you can charge well over 150 kW for certain model Teslas. And, you know, the other EVs, there's plug share has numerous other locations at along Route 65. And I just charge up early because when I get there, I don't want to, my first thing I want to do is visit family. So I stop along the way and charge so that when I get there, I'm still, I have enough charge for the entire weekend or as long as I'm staying there. And there's plenty of EV or destination chargers within Indianapolis. Explain to real quickly how many KW a standard house charger is for a Tesla or other EV brands compared to 150 or 250 at a Tesla supercharger. So on, on a standard outlet, just your standard plug outlet in a normal house is 120 volts, and that's one kW. And when you jump it up to a 240 volt system, you can get seven, eight kW charge as compared to a fast charging DC, which is 150 kW. So at one kW system, it will take a day or plus 24 hours to charge your car up from zero to 80 percent 90 percent on a 240 volt system which is about 7 kw it'll take three to four hours five hours depending on and of course it's all depending on your how your consumption of your battery or level your battery charge and on a 150 kw you're charging about 15 minutes from zero to 80. So, so it, yeah, it's a it crazy quickly charges. Yes. So, so what, one last question for you, you know, I'm a Tesla fanboy. Are Tesla's the best or is uh, f someone else going to come up and nab it, the uh, Rivian or whoever? Well, Tad, that's a, uh, everyone is answering their own question with that. Once they drive an EV, the, the Tesla, however, is built at the Fremont plant and other, some other locations. Tesla is far superior as an EV vehicle. However, the Nissan Leaf is a wonderful vehicle for people wanting to try EVs and get in at a lower price point. And they also have Ford Mach-E, which is a great EV Audi e-tron, if you want a vehicle that's just like a, your standard everyday car, and out, you know they make cars like that. Porsche's making a car. Um, and you also have your plug-in hybrid EVs, like a Jeep 4XE, which is electric and gas, which is very similar to the standard hybrids, like everyone understands the Prius. However, plug-in hybrids, EVs, you actually plug in and charge them from your wall source. Right. So yes, Tesla, Tesla is leading the race. Other car manufacturers are catching up. And but Tesla is a great vehicle for those that want to uh, experience Elon's uh, designs. <laughs> Thanks, Brad. I appreciate it. Sam is uh, going to talk to us now about batteries. Uh, a lot of people ask about batteries, and I'll just, uh, Sam, you want to jump in there and uh, is it on the right page for you? Yes. Okay, yes. so go Hi, ahead. I'll let, I'll let you lead. Sure. Hi, everyone. I'm Sam, and I'm going to talk about batteries today. So the good thing about going solar is you can retrofit your battery system into it, whether it is a Tesla solar roof or just your normal traditional panels, you can get, to, get a battery backup system um, along with your solar modules. Uh, if you already have solar, that is fine as well. You can just add on a battery. We would just have to, you know, have a compatible inverter. We'll come out and see, you know, if the inverter is compatible with the battery and just swap it out. Or nowadays we have Generac that have come up with, uh, solar ready inverters. So you already have the inverter in place and you can just, you know, uh, for future use, you could, we could just come out and plug in the battery. Now, basically what happens is, uh, Patrick, can you play the video? Uh, all the excess energy from your solar modules during the daytime um, goes to your battery. That's how your battery is charged. 
And if you see the flow of energy, your solar panels um, are charging your battery during the daytime and you can use that power during the night uh, to you know, basically power your home. So you could either do a whole backup system or like a partial load backup system, depending on you know, how much you want to back up. Um, obviously it helps you in the terms of grid outages and you know, you're safe, you don't have to sit in the dark when you have a battery backup system. Um, Patrick, can you go to the next slide? We have um, a lot of manufacturers these days. Tesla is definitely, you know, the number one. Everybody knows about it. But Generac, they have been, you know, in, into the backup industry for quite some time. And now they have jumped into the clean energy system. And they also have a very good battery. They have, like, various sizes. So does Enphase, SolarEdge, LGs. And then you have different battery sizes from different manufacturers, uh, you know, based on your consumption, we can just choose that. And then of course the co cost of it also varies. Um, and most batteries right now are modular and they are scalable. So for, suppose for now, this summer you're using thousand kilowatt hours, but next summer, you know, it increases to 2000 and you think you need more, more, you know, power to back up. So in that case, we can just come in and you know add one, one more battery to your existing system. So that's kind of cool when it comes to battery systems. Mm -hmm. um, apart from that, I guess, uh, based on your consumption, we will size the battery. You know, it, it is specific to your home and how much you want to back up. So those are the two main questions as homeowners, I guess you should be asking that what size battery, you know, should I be using? And, you know, after we do the load calculations, we'll come up with the numbers, basically. Sam, what, uh, one of the biggest questions that I asked early on in learning about solar was, I assumed that if the power goes out and I have solar and it's during the day, I'm good. I just run off the roof. Is that true or not? That is true. That is correct. Yes. Well, power... but, but only if you have a battery, right? That's correct. But uh, there's a game changing thing now in the industry. Enphase have come up with IQ8 micro inverters that helps you uh, power your house with solar, even though there's a grid outage with the help of the battery. So basically you have a small micro grid in your house. So even if there is an outage, Enphase is going to allow you to use the power from the solar directly. Uh, so technology is ramping up, I guess, and you know we are just go going in the right direction. Yeah, because to protect the uh, the electrical workers when the power goes out, they make That's you correct. shut off your solar. But if you have battery, you can you can use the battery. And that, so I guess yeah. the big point here is that a lot of people don't understand if you are going to buy solar and you're thinking about power outages, you should have some size of battery so that you can take advantage of that when the power goes off. That's correct. Yeah. Um, when, you know, this is uh, uh, one last question, and then we'll go to Drew for just sure. a couple more minutes. I, you know, this is a great time to talk about careers in solar. So That's to right. tell, can you tell us a little bit about your history, um, where, where you went to school and what kind of degree you got? And if someone's interested this in uh, getting into this industry from an engineering standpoint, how would they, how would they do it? Yeah, so I have my bachelor's in electrical engineering. Uh, I came uh, here in the US for my master's in solar energy engineering. Yes, there is a degree in solar energy engineering. Most people don't know that. It's Otherwise, it's just computer science, electrical engineering, and people don't know that there exists a degree in the US. Um, I studied in UMass Lowell, which is uh, in Massachusetts. And that was my pathway, you know, to go green and use my engineering skill set for the betterment of the planet, basically. So once you have your electrical degree or bachelor's, you can get your master's in solar energy engineering and even undergrad students can take courses, uh, grad courses. And that's how, you know, uh, there are a couple few courses that are very, very good and you can take it as an undergrad and add it to your resume. Uh, and also there are certificate courses available like Coursera, and there's NAPSEP and I mean heat spring, these are the sources where you can go and you know educate yourself. Uh, some are free courses, some are you know paid ones. So depending on what you want and how much you are into solar and going green, uh, you can invest. And then again, NAPSEP certification is one of the things that I highly recommend. 
uh, and obviously the trainer, Sean White. Uh, he's an IREC trainer and he's, be, he's one of the solar gurus and he's you know, been on the panel for National Electric Code. That's the code for solar if uh, people don't know. Uh, that's the safety code that we use while designing solar. So your system is safe and you know, electrically everything is sized correctly. Um, but yeah, I think the, these are the things that, that help you grow into this career. Yeah, it seems like a great career path. I have four kids yes. that are college age and I haven't been able to talk any of them to go into solar. And I think it's just because they want to do something other than what their dad tells them. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, thank you, Sam. Great job. Hey, Drew, you, you. Want to, uh, you want to finish us off here and then we'll see if there's any lingering questions before we sign off? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, thank you, Tad. Um, I am Drew Pippick and I'm uh, an analyst for Gain Renewables and, and I'm here to talk to you a little bit about uh, the incentives uh, in specifically uh, in the state of Illinois uh, with the SREC or the Adjustable Block Program. Um, as Tim mentioned earlier, um, the state of Illinois passed legislation in September uh, re reopening uh, the Adjustable Block Program, uh, which happened in December. Um, the Adjustable Block Program is a state administered um, solar incentive program. It's commonly referred to as uh, on the consumer side as Illinois Shines or, or um, in, in the solar world, it's, it's called Illinois SREX or SREC um, Solar Renewable Energy Certificates. And so um, this incentive program is, is really significant uh, for customers in, in Illinois and, and uh, you're able to uh, monetize your solar production um, over over 15 year contract uh, and it's and it's generally um, on the residential side it's front loaded and, and as well as the commercial side um, you, you get the, the, the monetization of those credits um, within the first uh, six years in most cases. And, um, and then also as uh, Tim touched a little bit on, uh, the reason the, the program really exists is um, investor utilities, uh, investor owned utilities are required to meet um, renewable portfolio standards uh, by, and what re renewable portfolio standards uh, really mean is, is 25% uh, by 25% um, of your electric generation or must come from renewable sources uh, by 2025 in the state of Illinois and, and 50% uh, must come from renewable sources in, in 2040. Next slide, Patrick, please. Um, it's important to note that this program isn't around, isn't going to be around forever in the state of Illinois, and there's a little bit of uh, um, there's remaining capacity available. Uh, blocks close um, regularly. We're actually on the fifth block of the program, and uh, the previous uh, three blocks um, and four and, and the fourth block as well are are closed and. Um, half of the capacity, uh, roughly half of the capacity uh, remains in the commercial uh, ComEd territory, as well as um, a little less than half in the residential um, ComEd territory uh, for, for those of us in the Chicagoland area. Uh, there's no guarantee of funding for the next block. It's important to note. So once the blocks close, there would be uh, additional um, legislation or, or funding that that would be required to to um, guarantee the next block. Um, so in in real terms, the the uh, the amount of um, remaining capacity in, in the ComEd territory for uh, businesses and commercials is roughly uh, for a for an average system about um, 150 kW. Uh, there's about 300. Um, mid-sized businesses left and then um, on in the ComEd territory on the residential side there's about 4,000 homes assuming a 10 kW um, system which is just slightly above average on, on, a, on the, the, the residential side. Back to you Tad.
Sorry, I had to unmute. Uh, question: um, What's the what's the best uh, rate of return, annual rate of return that you've seen in any of your proposals that you've done? Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, in, addi in addition to um, the SREC program in the state of Illinois, there's obviously the federal tax credit. And um, on a commercial side, the businesses are able to uh, fully depreciate um, the system year one called through something called bonus depreciation. And, um, and then lastly, there is another incentive um, to a local utility incentive called a smart inverter rebate, uh, which is applicable to most businesses in the area. But to answer your question directly, uh, when applying after all those um, incentives, uh, the, the, the average return for um, commercial businesses in the area, assuming a flat roof and, and different other factors is, is um, I've seen in excess of 30% IRR, um, but generally speaking, it, it's probably closer in the 25 uh, to 20% range. Yeah. So why wouldn't, why would a commercial business not, not do this if you're in Illinois right now in either Kent, ComEd territory or Ameren uh, inventory uh, or, uh, territory downstate? Uh, there's really no reason for for businesses to not to not to go solar. Um, it can it can eliminate a large um, portion of your one of your main operating expense expenses, and, and it can be a significant uh, cost reduction and free up some money uh, to to put into other um, parts of the business, which uh, everybody knows how important that is nowadays. Um, so there's really no reason. Um, there's there's Plenty of financing options, solar loans, and um, PPAs where there's zero out of pocket up front. And um, lastly, there's there's uh, a loan that you could obtain. Um, it's called CPACE, a Commercial um, uh, Property Assessed Clean Energy, uh, which able is able to um, place a loan um, and that is paid back through your tax uh, assessments each year. Oh, that's great. Um, let's uh, all unmute here. And uh, we've got five minutes left and we don't really have to say anything, but Tim, I want to go back to you. Are you still, you're still there? Oh, yeah. So uh, Tim, you've heard our various presentations. Uh, you know, what, what did we miss? What, what, uh, what are some of your thoughts in hearing all this? Wow. I'm super impressed with your team, Ted. You've uh, you've really built an organization of solar experts here in Illinois. It's nice to see how the industry has matured, you know. Um, so congratulations and and thank you all. My uh, my only comment was to Ron's uh, little spiel about EVs. I think he missed a couple of major manufacturers. One being Hyundai. Yep. Uh, which also has the Kia brand. There's Hyundai's and Kia's that are pure EVs and they're pretty sexy. Uh, my co-host, John Weaver, his battery just got dinged on his Model Y and they had to, uh, you know, uh, the, the vehicle is useless now because it's so expensive to replace the, the battery. But uh, so he's looking at a Hyundai now. And then VW is a major competitor uh, with the ID4 of, of the Tesla Model Y. So... Uh, you know, Ford, the Ford Lightning is going to be a very attractive Huge. Uh, EV truck. I have a deposit on a Rivian, a Ford <laughs> yeah. and a Cybertruck. And I'm guessing the Ford <laughs> is going to get to me first, but we'll see. We'll the see. race is on. Uh, they're all good vehicles. They're all solid. And, and Ron is very right that the industry has come a long way. And most consumers won't have range anxiety. For me, the the I'm an odd duck in that I had a Model Y for nine months and then I bought a camping trailer. And even, you know, in the winter, of course, the cold weather does ding your range. And I went back to an ice car, forgive me. Uh, but uh, once I get a, once the EV trucks are on the market, I'll go back to an EV. But for now, I'm driving a, a, a Toyota 4Runner. Yeah, I mean, they, oh, say nice. the F1, they say the F-150 is going to have, what, 600 and I don't know, pretty, pretty long range. And and then the crazy thing that I was talking with the team about last night was the bi-directional charging. So if our audience can get their head around this, the, the car, the F-150 is, they're actually hacking the Leafs and doing this with the Leafs right now. But 
officially uh, the F-150 is supposed to be bi-directional charging, meaning that that would be the battery for your house potentially. And that if the power goes out, you could power your house with your F-150. You know, this yeah. is a game, this whole luscious cycle uh, got me really excited about the business, about the idea of solar charging my car and then my car also being a backup source for uh, yeah. my house. But lastly, the idea that they're using in some places where cars will, during the day while you're parked at work, be plugged in and they'll provide power to the office building during peak uh, periods and stuff mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and cut down the cost of peak. The, a big uh, charge for the cost of energy is just producing the peaks, not producing the average or the lows. And so it, there's a lot of super geeky, cool stuff. Yeah, that vehicle, the grid technology is very sexy. I would encourage you all to check out Barry Cinnamon's podcast. He has a show called The Energy Show. Can you throw it, in a, a, throw it in the chat before you leave? Oh, sure. Yeah. And I do have to go here uh, to another meeting. But but Barry addresses this V to G stuff, and he's not as Pollyannish on it because the utility has to approve this as well. And utilities can be a major point of friction for distributed generation yeah. and battery storage. So we just have to wait and see, but Ford has a partnership with Sunrun, one of the largest you know, national solar installers, and, and that gives them a lot of street cred. So yeah, I'll put the, uh, the energy show in the chat and then I will say thank you and I got to sign off. Thanks, Tim. Really appreciate you coming on. Thank you. Thank you, Tim. Appreciate it. Thanks, Tim. Yeah, definitely. Thank you all. All right. So that just kind of wraps it up for today. I'm getting hungry for dinner. Uh, we nailed it for, to one hour. I don't know how we did it, but we did it perfectly. And um, we're going to obviously provide, uh, someone asked about presentation slides. Uh, we'll certainly uh, provide presentation slides to anybody who attended. I think we have your email address and, um, and we'll, um, we'll rebroadcast this too. I think we're going to put a link up on our, on our website. And also that will be linked to the YouTube. So thanks guys. Any other questions before we sign off? Nope. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thanks guys. Have a good night. Thank you. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.